Hello and welcome to part two. Yes, this is a troubleshooting and repair video of a Yaesu FT 1000 MP Mark V. Now, we'll just do a quick recap of the first video. Uh, we got the radio in, uh, it had no transmit or receive. Obviously it was all lighting up and doing, looked like it was doing what it was supposed to be doing, but it couldn't transmit or receive. So initially we, decided that we were going to tackle the receive problem first and hopefully uh, the transmit and receive problem were linked uh, we still haven't quite established that so we the first thing we did was obviously put the thing on to a signal generator and we found it could receive but however <laughs> the power it needed uh, the output on the signal generator was incredibly high uh, and the receiver was literally given as one bar on the S meter. So we did a bit of investigation. We did a bit of injection testing, RF injection testing, uh, using, uh, it was basically a, a scope probe plugged into the signal generator. And we just, you know, it's very loosely coupled and we just dabbed around the um, front end of the receiver. And we kind of figured out where the problem was uh, between the bandpass filters and uh, obviously the antenna socket. And following on from that, we got the board out, uh, got the multimeter and just literally did diode checks and resistance checks. And we found that four diodes in the receive path were open circuit. So that basically leads us on to where we are now. We've got some more diodes that got delivered today. I've ordered them from Farnell. These are not the same diodes that were installed. I think these are gonna be better if I'm honest, but we'll go through that as we go on and I'll go through the part numbers and how I got to uh, selecting these. And then ultimately uh, we'll be able to test them if we can get the radio back up to speed. Um, and working, then we, yeah, we'll be able to test and do some performance testing on the receiver. But I've got a feeling these are going to be fine, and these are probably going to be a lot more robust than what was originally installed, and a hell of a lot cheaper too. On the way to add. Okay, so if you're new to the channel and you like this content, uh, please consider subscribing or you know hitting the like button as it really helps the channel, we're trying to grow the channel. So, uh, you know, thank you in advance for your support. Okay, so let's get into this. So first of all, let's have a look at the uh, diodes in the circuit diagram we're actually going to be replacing. That's it, okay. So we went through this in part one. I'll just, I'm not gonna go through it all again, but I'm just gonna show you the part. So this is a signal path here. Obviously, the signal comes down through this capacitor. These are our receive signals, and we've got these two diodes. So both of these diodes are open circuit. Now, this is uh, D1056, which is uh, 1SV271. Now, that's a pin drop diode. And this one here, which is D1055, now that's just a regular switching diode. Now, in the part one, I wasn't 100% sure what was happening here, but I, I figured it out. So, as we looked before, this diode down here, uh, 1057, now that's connected to the RX8. So in receive mode, that goes high, which in turn passes through this coil, or coils, comes along here, and it goes on to the anode of this diode which in turn, following this path down to ground here, will put that diode in forward bias so that the signals can pass through. Um, this, this, case, this diode is connected to the TX8. So what happens is when we go into transmit mode, this will go high and the RX8 will go low. And what that will do is reverse the bias this diode so it will be a hard shut off of the uh, signals passing through um, this stage 
So they both need replacing, and we've got two more which have gone open circuit, which we've found simply with the multimeter. So we've got D1011, again, it's a pin diode, and we've got D00, no, D1009, if I can say it, and that's gone open circuit. And how that's there being biased, I'm not 100% sure, but they're open, we're gonna replace them. I can check once we've got the diodes in, we've got the correct voltages at this point, and at this point, we've already checked that, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's have a look at the circuit board. Okay, so down here, this is D1055, uh, which is the switching diode. In fact, let's just zoom in on that if we can. Okay, and this tiny little thing down here, if you can see that, that's D1056, and that's the pin diode. Now you can see, if you look carefully, that looks like it's been replaced. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's burn marks here, so whoever's been in here has caught the relay. Yeah, these things happen. Um, I'm hoping that's okay. I'm going to replace it, but I, I think that I'll wait until we get further into it because I've got a feeling we're going to need more relays. But uh, yeah, so I don't want to put one order in. But that's those two. And if we turn this thing over, these two here, these are our two pin diodes that need to be replaced. Okay, so let's get the soldering iron on and uh, get these bad boys in. Okay, well I've got the, these are the ones I've removed, the diodes, and you can see that switching diode just fell apart. Uh, you'll see in a second when I show on the board, and these are the diodes, I think I've lost one of them. Oh no, that's three, yeah, so that's four diodes. Okay, so I've got the diodes removed, and uh, you know, if you look down here, you can see the switching diode. Now, you can see all the black marks here, so that's really gone with the bang, that thing. Um, and I've got the, the little pin diode out from here. That was quite tricky to get in while that relay's there. And if you attempt this yourself at home, I would seriously consider removing this first. But this one's already damaged, so I'm going to probably replace it anyway. But that has gone with the bad, which it basically compounds my theory that it's had RF reverse down into the uh, radio and that could well be a number of things as we said it could be a sticking relay on the um the tuner board that does all the rf routing or it could well be that somebody's had it on an antenna switch and they've got a couple of banks and they've accidentally trans you know fired another radio into the <laughs> input of this one um okay uh, this what i'm going to do now is i'm going to clean all this up with isopropyl and solder wick and get all these joints nice and clean and we'll solder the new parts in now as i said these aren't the exactly the same diodes as um that, that i've taken out the radio uh, simply because they're obsolete <laughs> and uh yeah uh, if you stick around to the end of the video i'll go through how i've arrived at these uh, these devices and um, you know I can show you can compare data sheets and stuff and of course these are very small devices so yes yeah, so that's the pin diodes see that it's tiny isn't it uh yeah that's my finger you can see how big it is so very easy so i'll take one out at a time
Okay, so yeah, that's in. I've got that. That's the diode soldered in. <laughs> I caught that relay there. It just slipped. You've only got to go near it, and they'll damage. It looks all right. I think it'll it'll be fine. Uh, and we've got the diode here. Shall we? Just going to put a bit of isopropyl on there, but uh, yeah, I think what we need what we need to do is get this back in the radio and see what we are getting. So as you can see, we've got the uh, board back in. I haven't put all the screws in yet, um, but I've got it connected up. There's, there's, I've got screws. You need screws because it needs to, obviously, you know, there's the board screened and it needs to connect. But I've just got the bare minimum in there, uh, literally just to test it. Now, the first thing I want to do is take a look at, there was that switching diode, which is whether you can see that that's this one here now that's being fed from uh, with this resistor and that's on the other side of that resistor that's what goes back to the tx8 now obviously that thing failed quite dramatically that diode so i just want to see i think this is uh, r159 it's supposed to be a 330 uh, ohm resistor yeah that's on the money that's pretty good okay so the next thing to do is switch it on now i've not connected the uh, antenna in and i've also got the that goes up to the pa and i've just got it shorted out so i'm going to switch the radio on and the reason i've done that with the cables is simply because you know i don't I'm concerned about RF coming down here and I don't want this thing transmitting either. So let's just get, put some power on it. Let's adjust the multimeter to DC volts. Okay, I'll just connect the negative uh, probe to ground. And let's see what we've got on that resistor. Okay, so we're in receive mode and we're getting uh, zero volts. Let's see what happens when we put it in transmit. So I'm just gonna hit the MOX button, the MOX button. and Yeah, that's good. On the other side of that resistor. Yeah, well it's dropping 2.5 volts. Okay, so I'd say that's okay. So the next thing to do is put this on a signal generator. I'm going to feed it directly into this point. I'm really worried about what's going on on this side. Um, so I, I, we need to adjust that. But let's see if we can get a signal through and see if it's receiving. Okay, so I've got the coaxial cable connected to the input point on the RF board. Uh, and that's obviously being fed by the signal generator. Um, you know, as we did in part one, um, obviously we're in receive mode, I'm set to 28 megs and the uh, mode is USB, zero attenuation and AGC on auto. And if you can see, we're actually getting activity. So it's actually picking up noise by the looks of it. And you can actually hear it, the SIG gen's not on. Now I've got switch mode power supplies in here and all all sorts um, so the thing to do is is to turn on the sig gen and i'll just go through it quickly so if we just have a quick look i don't know if you can see this um with the output level is set to minus 73 dbm uh, we've got a frequency of 28 megahertz modulation single sideband and we have got a positive AF frequency of one kilohertz. And the modulation index is 40%. Okay, we did get uh, some comments regarding the signal generators and obviously testing radios and the fact that obviously we're dealing in DBMs and we've got a single sideband option for modulation you don't need this um you can do it with just a straight signal generator i'll go through it in a little bit more detail at the end of the video 
um, you know, for those who are interested. But we can actually test radios with very basic signal generators. Okay, so let, let's get this going. So let's switch this signal on. Oh, yes, that's good. And let's have a look. Okay, so that's given us S9, and that's perfect for minus 73 dBm, which is good because, you know, I was concerned about damage because that diode had gone so, um, what's the word? It, it went so violently, you know, I was worried it, was, it had damaged other things, you know, coils and such like. But initially, that looks good. Now, what I'm going to have to do is go through every single band um, on this and make sure that it's switching the correct filters. Okay, so I've been through all the bands. Um, it seems to be working fine. I've noticed as we get down uh, the frequency, I mean, obviously we're on top band or 160 meters, 1.8 megs whatever you like, uh, it's slightly lower the S meter. So we are injecting minus 73 um, dBm. So I'm not too worried about that, if I'm honest. I think it may be just a consequence of those diodes I've put in. It may be that they're a slightly different characteristic to the original ones. Um, could be, could simply be that the meter is out of calibration. But the thing to do would be to do a uh, sensitivity test on it and obviously do a signal to noise or sign ed uh, test on it with a signal generator and a, and a signal to noise meter. Um, I've t obviously I've wound the signal generator back and yeah, it's sensitive enough. I can't do these type of tests while the radio is in this state simply because We've got screens off, there's bare wires here, there and everywhere. And basically, you know, and I, I would really want it to go through its proper signal path, which is via this tuner, because there's a lot of switch routing, uh, signal routing with relays in there. So, yeah, we'll get to that. But there's nothing of too much of concern. I have noticed that when, if you watch this, if we... Now I'm actually on AM at the moment, so I'm injecting the AM signal into it. But you see it drops back a little. There's a there's a threshold point there. You can hear I'll turn that down. You can hear the relay switching. So so that's most probably switching in the uh, the pre bandpass filters. And it may be that we're just getting a bit of insertion loss because we do get insertion loss in bandpass filters. You know, you will in any filter, or LC filter, you know, the passive and in, for the action of filtering, it takes a little bit of energy. So that's why you lose it, you know, so. Okay, so let's have a look at the tuner unit. Now this is the thing of, I have quite a few, uh, concerns about because it could well be that this has caused all the damage in here so I don't know if you can see but if you look here you can see that there has been some soldering done so somebody's obviously been in here um, and taken that board out now what I am interested in is the continuity between these two antenna sockets not between them, but the path between the antenna socket through to this point. That's our RX um, coaxial cable that brings down, you know, our RX, our receive signals from the antenna sockets. So depending on whether it's switched on A or B, there should be a path through down to here. Now we'll have a look at the schematic in a second, but it looks to me like it should be we should have continuity straight through. So if I, I've got the multimeter here, just give me a second. Okay, so we've got the multimeter set. Uh, the radio is set on, 
let's put it on antenna, antenna A. Right, so she's now on antenna A. This is antenna A here. Let's put the... Okay, we see 329 ohms. Let's switch that off. Turn what? Switch it over to antenna socket B. And that's... You see the meter's going nuts. That means it's getting a signal. It's struggling. There's some reason that's uh, it's not liking that. But we should have continuity on here. Which is 300 ohms. Which 300 ohms seems a bit high to me. Okay, so let's take a look at the schematic. Now, I'll tell you right now, I've recorded this quite a number of times. I could never get it right. I just wasn't happy with it. But let's see how we go. Okay, so this is the tuner main unit. And this is that circuit board that's to the right. Now, this is the complete schematic of the board. It's broken into two sections. So we've got this section here, as you see, isn't really connected to anything. Now, this is for RF plumbing. It's basically routes the uh, transmission and the receive uh, signal paths because it's a transceiver and we're using the same antenna socket or sockets. So it's quite critical that this uh, works correctly. Um, and the other section is this section here, which is here. And you know, part of it is there as well. But that's completely separated, as you can see. It's, it's separated from the switching circuits. So we've basically got two RF um, coaxial connections here. Um, one of them will be an input. I'm not sure which one. And one will be the output from the ATU. And on this side, there's uh, quite a number of connections, which, you know, just come from the control board, I imagine. And um, that will just, you know, all the programs in the market controller. So it will do its tuning routines to find the best SWR from the antenna to the radio. OK, so what we're interested in is this. And um, let's see if we can zoom in. Okay, I'll probably zoom out just a touch. Okay, so what we have here is we've got antenna socket A and antenna socket B, and this is where they actually solder onto the printed circuit board. So we've got two uh, uh, paths coming up here that come to these relays. So we've got one relay here which goes down to antenna socket B. And another relay here, which connects to antenna socket A. Now, these relays um, will switch and create a path. And the path that they create, create is connected to this point. So, yeah, so this is a bi-directional uh, point. This means that you know, so we get receive signals down here or we get the transmission signals up here and they'll go into these relays which will route the signals, whether they're incoming or outgoing, to the relevant antenna socket A or B. Okay, so let's move on. And so we've got our antenna uh, path through the switching. Uh, to this point and then we've got another relay and this relay here and you see it comes down now basically what happens is this relay coil here is you know, controlled or switched via this transistor here it's a 2SA something or other and if they if you see Japanese transistors it's like the JIS standard um, 2SA means it's PNP. So what's happening here is the uh, emitter is connected to this point, which is the 13.8 volt rail, and the output, well, the output is the collector, is then connected through and into this relay coil, and then from the relay coil it goes down to ground. Now what happens is you've got a pull-up resistor there, so 
and uh, if there's no voltage here this resistor will pull up and this will be switched off so it's only when this the base here goes low and it has to be taken low uh, this will switch on and in turn switch on this relay which connects the antenna path from here through the switch through this um, inductor here down to this point here I think it says RX out and that connects on to our RF uh, board uh, I think it's called the RF board but it's that cable that we tested so so what we, what we were doing when we were testing with the multimeter was, so we were taking a reading a continuity reading or resistance reading from antenna A through to this cable here that plugs into our RF unit and depending on which relay up up here whether uh, the you know this was switched on or off will determine how the RF signals are routed through whether it's antenna A or antenna B now we were seeing 300 ohms at that point which is a bit alarming because there's nothing else there these are only switches uh, we've got a relay here and this inductor and DC on the inductor at uh, on a multimeter and I think that says 0.24 U or micro Henry yeah I'm not sure but um, yeah that's I can't see that being 300 ohms not not at DC obviously okay so yeah I think we need to sort of check this path here through to this antenna socket this RX out rather um, yeah through to each antenna socket so we need to look at these relays it could be that they've got um, damaged contacts on them it sounds you know obviously radios that front end was in a bit of a state so there's been a bit of juice coming up from somewhere and I'd, I'd be very surprised if it hasn't damaged something in here so yeah look at these relays we look at this one this is of a particular interest make sure that it's okay uh, this uh, inductor and I want to make sure this thing is switching properly as well so it's uh, you know it's all working as it should do so let's just move on to the transmitter path and that is here so I think that this one here comes from the uh, PA or actually ultimately it'll come from the low pass filter now our RF signals come up that we want to transmit goes up into this relay and all this relay is is just switching in and out these two RF connectors here which in turn I believe just connect up to here so it just switches in and out the um, the antenna tuning unit it's pretty straightforward stuff and a path comes along and we have got uh, an AC coupling capacitor a switching diode and another AC coupling capacitor and that's our path through and then we go back into these relays yada 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 and then we pop out of the antennas uh, A and B sockets okay so what's actually happening here well this diode is switched so we know looking at the um, small signal stuff you know if the bias if it's forward bias or reverse bias it will let uh, the signals pass or it will uh, do its damnedest to stop the uh, signals passing and it's exactly the same for the power RF so let's look at this in a bit more detail so if we look up here we've got this thing called it looks like T9 but I think that's T8 TX8 so if we key the mic this line will go high to 8 volts and what will happen is we've got uh, a transistor here this is an MPN transistor there's a couple of resistors here at the back they're doing some biasing but what will happen is if this goes this base goes high this will switch on and if this switches on 
you know it, what it's doing is it's pulling everything down to ground at this point so if we move along we've got this transistor here which is PMP device which is ultimately connected to this rail here which is our 13.8 volts which comes in on the emitter now if this as we say this goes low when the TX8 uh, goes high what will happen is this transistor will switch on and it will make this point high now this carries on through and goes back to this point and obviously if this goes high it will de-energize the uh, relay which would make complete sense so you key the mic the RF path is broken to the uh, the rest of the receiver and when you de-energize it, it does as the opposite effect and it will close the relay so what else is going on well that's about it really um, the only thing you've got to really consider is obviously you know we talked about this transistor so in transmit mode this switches on this goes high this goes high at this point this diode will go forward bias and ultimately because we're using the two transistors you know that's when that's been switched on this will be low so this will be in forward bias and we will have signals passing through this is our transmission signals and if uh, the TX line goes low we have the opposite effect you know TX line goes low this is here this switches off uh, this point is being you know this line's being pulled high from that 13.8 rail so this will ultimately go high and you know it's going to reverse bias the diode so one way or the other you know it, it has exactly the same effect this side as well so it's in receive it's in reverse bias and in transmit it's in forward bias and when it's in forward bias mode it will let the signals pass now we have had quite a catastrophic problem on the the rf board with a diode exploding and all the rest of that good stuff that we've managed to fix so i suspect there's a problem up here so we need to make sure these transistors here are switching properly this one's switching properly so it's switching in and out the relays we need to check these paths because i've got that 300 ohm thing which doesn't look good uh, which i'd suspect it's probably fried this coil here um, or it could have well damaged the uh, you know the contact uh, of this relay the little contact points of the relay so yeah mm. so well the thing to do like, we need to get this board uh, well I say get it out I think I'm gonna see if I can kind of get it out but keep it connected so we can just take some voltage readings and we can kind of hopefully figure out uh, what's wrong here okay so I've had a look at this and I you know I'm gonna take it out but I've got a problem now there's this transistor here this is that switching transistor it's a PMP device that actually switches on the uh, relay for the receive and the relay for the receive is under here so this point here that's one side of the coil and this point here is the other side which is obviously taken to ground and our switch is here so it's that center pin and that pin there now there's some strange stuff happening here so let's just put this on the voltmeter and I'll show you what it's doing so this is the base which is at 2.5 volts this is I can get it that's the emitter at 13.4 yeah that's our 13.8 volt rail basically 
and this is the collector so at the moment going into that coil we've got 13.7 volts so if I throw this into transmit that goes down to 1.3 volts now I think that's a problem read relays are very very sensitive I know it's a 12 volt relay but that could be pulling it so I'd say there's a fault here and looking at this if we look at the base when we switch the base is going high yeah 12.47 now I'd have to just calculate on the um because these have got internal biasing resistors but I'd say that transistor is no good also a concern I've got there's this looks like an inductor just tacked on to the, the back of the ball which yeah isn't good so this transistor could be the, the problem because if that relay for any reason has pulled while this thing's in transmit mode all that RF is going to come down and go into the receiver which it looks like it has now there's another thing here as well so if I just change the meter over to uh, resistance and we just own this thing out just one second I can find my probe okay so it's on resistance we are in receive mode and look at it now we've got if we go on one side of that relay switch to the other yeah, it's going into one again something's on there oh did I put it on the right one I don't think I did okay so we go this side of the switch there we're getting 1.9k and that's supposed to be pulled in so I'd say the the read the, the read relay is shot you know that's that's you know as well and truly gone because we check this side to the path here should. yeah so that's homing out so so the switching relay for antenna a socket seems to be okay and then let's just switch this over uh, let's put that on this one yeah that one's switching over so we've got continuity at that point and we're not getting anything through the relay now if I go this side of the relay and we connect on to the receive uh, signal that goes into the board, yeah, we've got a path. So we've got a problem in that read relay. I think this transistor is also shot and I'm going to have to do some investigation to see what this is. It looks like an inductor. I can't see Yaser would issue something like that. I mean it has been known but I, I can't see it. So I'm going to need to get this board out and then I'm going to also look at the TX, uh, you know, switching path and make sure that's okay and test those transistors. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to obviously c carry on in the next video because I've got to order the parts. So I'll make another video once I get the parts here. And, you know, in the meantime, I did say we'd have a look at the signal generators and the diode, so that will be coming up next. So stand by. DBM, microvolts. DBM, microvolts. DBM, microvolts. Hmm. Okay, so in the previous video, we got a comment. Uh, it was regarding a certain type of signal generator. And this is the FieldTech uh, FY6900. Now, this is more of a waveform generator. And for setting up radio receivers, this isn't probably the best choice. In fact, it's not very good at all. Um, and I'll explain why. If we come down to the specifications...
Let's come down. Yeah, okay. So we've got output characteristics. And uh, we've got a resolution of one millivolt. So it will only change the size of the waveform in one millivolt steps. And we've got a minimum uh, amplitude of one millivolt. Now that's a bit of a problem with radio equipment. Now, it also said that this wouldn't display DBM. Well, it won't because it's not, it wouldn't be really useful on a piece of equipment like this. Obviously when we talk about DBMs, it's typically you would deal with radio waves um, and it's, a, it's just literally a unit of power and DB, is deca bell and so deca means 10 or order of 10 and uh, the bell is that guy who invented the telephone and m means milli and we're talking about power so it's watts so if i can demonstrate this if i come over to this, is this page now this is a conversion uh, uh, sheet or a chart I'll leave a link to this in the description it's quite a handy thing to have floating around the workshop so DBMs to microvolts conversion chart for 50 ohms so um, microvolts is just volts but multiplied by you know my 10 to the minus 6 so and if we look here, we've got minus 47 dBm is a thousand microvolts. So there's a thousand microvolts in one millivolt. And our signal generator, this um, field tech generator, will only move in one microvolt step. So if you want to set up a receiver, you need to get down into these really small numbers and do it reasonably accurate. And, you know, a lot of these signal generators that i use like i've got marconi's Warren Schwartz, hewlett packard they're designed specifically for radio equipment um for doing this because obviously when we're calibrating or setting up receivers or you know we want to take we want to take uh, like signal to noise tests and stuff it gets you know to cal to calculate these things we need quite an accurate signal and the problem is with that you're not going to get it so um yeah that's it in a nutshell okay so if we just have a quick look at this website um i'll leave a link to this as well you can see you've got all the signal strengths here on uh, the left and it will it tells you um obviously what the dbm set you know signal level should be uh, and it also does it in microvolts. So if we look at S9, 50 microvolts, and that's minus 73 dBm. Um, and that's below 30 megs. It actually, you know, when you start going above 30 megs into VHF, you know, I think, what is it, S9 then becomes minus 93. Because uh, VHF and beyond is a bit of a different beast, E2HF. I'm not going to go into that in this video. Okay, so yeah, the long and the short of it is, unfortunately, this isn't really suitable for uh, you know setting up or calibrating radio equipment. Okay, and there was another comment regarding my test equipment. What was actually happening when we were modulating in SSB? Um, well, it's not a lot really. It's literally, it's a nice feature on a signal generator to be actually be able to modulate a single sideband signal. But as I said, you don't necessarily need that. And in fact, a lot of the time you don't. So what, uh, what you would do normally is take a dead carrier so let's say you're at 30 megs and you tune your radio your receiver to 30 megahertz and if you put it on to upper sideband you know the receiver and if you went back to your signal generator and added one kilohertz to that signal theoretically you should be hearing 
one kilohertz tone coming out of your receiver out the speaker and if you wanted to go to lower sideband you do the whole thing again but instead of adding uh, one kilohertz to the signal generator you would actually take it down by one kilohertz and then providing your receiver is in tune uh, you should hear a one kilohertz tone or there thereabouts coming out of the speaker just before I go there are some budget um, signal generators that do have DBM I'm not 100% sure on these I know I can see the range on this this comes in I think this is obviously Chinese uh, yes this thing is coming in at 145 pounds it goes from half a meg to 470 megahertz there doesn't seem to be any modulation on this it says audio modulation audio generator module built in to 800 hertz yeah i'm not quite sure what that is let's uh, come down but yeah look it's got a signal strength which from between minus 70 to minus 132 dbm which is fine for you know radio receivers the, obviously the type of equipment we're working with um yeah because at minus 132 you're getting so small you're really getting into the noise um minus 70 well as we know minus 73 is s9 uh the only thing i'm not too sure about is this built-in 800 hertz audio modulation yeah modulating what is it am fm it doesn't say so uh i don't know if anybody's familiar with this uh, leave it in the comments um, I think there is quite a few reviews so I'm not endorsing this by the way <laughs> at all because I don't know anything I've never played with one but it's just to say that there are you know there are uh, budget um, signal generators available and um, it's like anything you know with test equipment it's how much do you want to pay you know it's uh, it can get really expensive and a lot of the gear i've got so old gear and you know it's expensive to maintain people sometimes people want silly money for the equipment you know but um yeah that's it really well i hope this was a help and um yeah if you've got any more suggestions leave them in the comments okay so last and not least uh we get down to these diodes now the pin dials that we removed i think i took three of them out that were blown now these the original ones were actually manufactured by toshiba and it's the one sv271 and this is the data sheet for it now these are obsolete um they do have a tendency of going wrong but i think that i'm quite you could probably say that about most pin diodes they um you know they are very susceptible to um static discharge or you know adverse conditions and it just fries them so I looked on the uh, major suppliers for this and obviously there is nothing there they, they haven't got any stock on them so the other option was uh, let's have a look so we could have a look at eBay and uh, you know there's a guy here he's selling them for four four pounds 99 each which is a, I don't know it's about five US dollars um, or maybe a little higher which is I think it's just ridiculous um, so I had to dig around to find a an equivalent so and I found these these are made by Infineon and I've got this from Farnell you can also buy them at um, DigiKey so if we look at the data sheet on this Oh, yeah, there's a bit of information on here now you can get this in there's a number of different types this is the uh, o3w uh, it just they're all the same devices they just come in different packages so this one here if we let's have a look it's 
Bear with me. Ah, it's here at the bottom. So it's saying it's in an SOD323 package. Now, if you compare that to the um, the dimensions to the Toshiba device, they're exactly the same. They're calling it a 1 1E, um, 1A package. Um, that's probably something to do with Toshiba. But they're exactly the same. So it's an SOD323 package. And if we come down and look at the ratings, let's see if we can zoom in on that a bit. The only thing I was really interested in. So this thing has got a reverse voltage of 150 volts. And if we look at the Toshiba, that's only 50. So this is a bit higher. Um, the forward current's 100 milliamps on this device, and the Toshiba is 50, so it's kind of a little stronger. And also on the Toshiba, there's the capacitance, which I was a bit concerned about. So they're saying, you know, because it's going to vary, it's just typical, but 0.25. Now, if you, uh, Pika Farrows, now if, if you in filtering circuits, and circuits have been designed around something. It's a good idea to keep this capacitance the same and you know the lower the capacitance the less chance it has of interfering with other circuits you know tuned circuits and if we look at this one let's have a look does it give the capacitance and it should do this is quite a big document this is really for developing i just wanted something simple here we go let's have a look okay capacitance okay this is this goes right into it okay 20 volts there frequency of one megahertz is between uh two, 0 0.23 and 0 0.35 um so yeah so i put them in they seem to work so you know and these are, are cheap i mean if you compare the prices you know i think digi digi key were cheaper but obviously i'm based in the uk so, well, they're coming in at 39p, and if you want to buy, if you want to buy 10 of them, you can get them for two, uh, two pounds 95. I think the pound and the dollar are pretty much the same at the moment, are they? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's what uh, you know. That's what you can get them for, and they they work. I'm not going to go through that number. You can just I'll leave it in the description. So you can do a search for it, and if we look at so there's another data sheet here. Let's just write that down. Right. Okay. Yeah, you can see you can get them in different packages. So this one here is the one we want is the BAR sixty four dash O three W, and the O three W is the SOD three two three package. Um, the other ones, if you these you know they're different sizes and if you go down to the you know if you go down here it tells you in the data sheet if we can get there yeah there we go sc79 and it gives you the dimensions they're simply um yeah different size packages and the other thing to bear in mind on these other ones with these different numbers they're all the same diodes it's just that you get two in uh each package and then there's different orientation of the diodes but that is it and they're made by Infineon and they Infineon are a good company and um, yeah that does the job now there's the other diode that I was looking at was the one we removed for the switching the one that went bang uh, this is a D one n60 and this had me confused because i thought it was a one n60 now one n60 uh i believe is a germanium type diode and it's yeah it just had me confused so what i did i reached out to trx lab and spoke and uh, sent an email to peter who kindly uh returned my email and uh, he recommended that we use a 1N, um, is it 4005? And we can, this, I think this is just, it's like a standard recovery diode. I don't think these are anything special. 
Uh, this is a general purpose sort of diode and if we look at what I actually installed, let's have a look. Yeah, so I got these from Farnell. This, these are very, very common. These are made by On Semiconductor. As you can see, they, you know, they're, oh, they're quite expensive here if you buy five, but yeah, I'm sure you can get them a lot cheaper. I'll look at this, the um, the data sheet. Yeah, so I want them four double oh five. Let's just go down and have a look. Ah, here we go. So here we go, 600 volts, and um, you know there are, it's a one and it's a one highlight and it's a one amp device. Um, if we compare that to this one, we can see 600 volts and it's one amp. So there we have it, and there's the diodes. That's it. Okay, well thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next video.